This is episode 86 of The Variety Artist. This is John Abrams, your host and that guy that interviews successful variety artists from around the world. Today I'm interviewing David Aiken, the checkerboard guy. In today's interview, David reveals the secrets of why he's so successful. Yes, it's the checkerboard. Yes, he's one of the best performers in the world. Yes, he's a nice guy, but it's more than that. David has interests as far-reaching as beekeeping and beer brewing. His amazing skills, constant quest for knowledge, and promotion of other entertainers has made him one of the most sought-after acts around. On the show today, David reveals the busker's secret formula, a spectacular promotional tool, and so much more. Together, we even reveal some of the inner workings of the Variety Artist podcast. On a personal note, He's one of the easiest guys to work with ever. He responded to all my emails, lickety split. He read through all my crazy material. He even listened to a bunch of variety artist podcasts before the interview. He really did his homework. There's so much on this one. Enjoy. Fun fact number 27. John is an admitted chocoholic. Welcome to The Variety Artist, providing aspiring artists and entertainers with in-depth discussions from top performers from all over the world. So get ready to book some gigs, make some money, and have some fun with your host, John Abrams. Known as an infectious bundle of energy wrapped by a dynamic skill set that consistently generates guffaws from spectators. He's part juggler, part unicyclist, but all comic daredevil extraordinaire. He's performed on cruise ships, in the festival circuit, on big stages, and much, much more. Variety artist, I give you the checkerboard guy, David Aiken. And here I am. And here you are. Bam, just like that. When David is performing, he's the checkerboard guy. He has checkerboard pants, vest, a checkerboard top hat, the whole thing, right? Yeah. What different uh, configurations of checkerboards are you wearing not now, but <laughs> when I'm doing shows, it started off in the early eighties when Vans sneakers were really popular. The black and white checkerboard Vans that uh, were all the rage with skateboarders. Mm-hmm. I got a pair at the time that checkerboard pattern was also really popular in other places. So I was making these wraparound pants that I found at a craft fair, but it was really, I was really trying to emulate some of the heroes that I had when I was growing up. There was a guy named Waldo who performed with a guy named Woodhead, so the Waldo Woodhead show, but before they joined it forces, it was just Waldo on his own. And he had these wrap pants and I thought they were the coolest thing ever. So I found checkerboard fabric, I had checkerboard shoes, I made a pair of checkerboard pants, then somebody gave me a checkerboard bandana. And I was working really regularly in Ottawa down in the Byward Market. And Mm -hmm. people would say, oh, that guy who juggles, he does shows like Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, always wears a checkerboard, you know, he juggles. He's the guy with the checkerboards, the checkerboard guy. And it was a name that people gave me. Oh, it just sort of sank in like that. And it's become a really useful sort of hook or marketing promotional kind of thing. So so when you were first putting this all together, did you know that it was a good marketing thing or did you just start wearing cool things that you liked? I started wearing the stuff that I liked. It became sort of like the Steve Jobs costume, like the the black turtleneck and jeans. That was just what he wore. You didn't have to think about it. And for me, I wanted to have a consistency to what I was doing. So that bandana and pants and, and top hat and everything else just became that consistent look and feel. So I did the festival circuit for years and that the pants, shoes, bandana, t-shirt and top hat were the look and then when I started doing more indoor stage stuff I went to a checkerboard vest black tuxedo pants and a bright yellow shirt so the 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 look changes a little bit depending on the venue I'm in and you know the cool thing about branding yourself as the checkerboard guy is not only is it your performing persona but you can also take it into other types of businesses Oh, sure. And, and and keep that same brand, right? Just the look and the feel of it is is so consistent and has been for so many years that if somebody says, I, I'm sure you've run into this too. I saw a magician doing a show. It, it, it was you, wasn't it? And it was like, no, it wasn't me. I was nowhere near the area at the time. But of course you say, well, was it a guy wearing checkerboards? And if, if the answer is no, then you can say it wasn't me. That identifiable recognition is something that really goes a long way. Sure. That helps a lot. In fact, I have a funny story about that. Do you know Buster Balloon? No. Do you know who that is? Okay. Buster Balloon is very much the opposite of me. Okay. He's bald and he looks like a balloon is what he looks like. And he's great. He's very famous in the, in the balloon world. Uh, And we run in the same circuits. Uh, I ran into a kid one time that says, Oh yeah, you were, you were here six months ago and you got into that big giant balloon. Right. Right. I, I said, 
no, that wasn't me. <laughs> I mean, he looks so different than me. If you saw the two of us together, you would say, oh my gosh, I can't how believe could you, Yeah. How yeah. could you ever be mistaken for each other? That's just not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You would never, like, you'd never run into that thing. It, in the beginning, it was just a, a sort of a thing I fell into. And then over time, it just became such a powerful recognition point, branding point, however you want to call it, that it just, I stuck with it and I just haven't gotten rid of it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. So what does your act actually look like for people who haven't seen you before? Okay, so comedy juggling show. I ride a unicycle. I have three different finales I was doing when I was doing the festival world. I did one that was a tall unicycle, one that was a slack rope where I tied one end to a tree or a telephone pole or whatever, like a fixed object, mm -hmm. ran that rope over the top of a ladder that I have and then had it held down by audience members. So that was finale number two. And then the third one I came up with, I did sort of a, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you're familiar with Evil Knievel. Oh yeah. Are you kidding? I grew up with Evil Knievel. Perfect. Did you have the motorcycle toy? I didn't have the little motorcycle toy, but I remember the commercials and I've seen your sec 60 second video of your son playing with the Evil <laughs> Knievel toy. Yeah. Yeah. They re-released the toy and I had one when I was growing up and I so remembered that excitement and seeing the footage of him jumping over buses and the the fountain at Caesar's Palace and anybody who doesn't know who Evil Knievel is in what is it the seventies I guess yeah um, the seventies yeah, yeah he was the famous guy in the white suit in fact I don't know if he was the first guy in the white suit or Elvis was the first guy in the white suit they were like both at the same time I mean, I, probably uh, and and he'd ride a motorcycle and what he'd do is yeah he just like David saying he'd jump buses and and his big thing Thing was he jumped the Grand Canyon that was a big deal on TV at the time Snake River Canyon in the 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 jet cycle yeah that's right that's right <laughs> didn't make it but he didn't make it over he didn't quite make it over it came <laughs> yeah, and in that. fact he 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 jumped it and then the wind uh stopped him and it took him backwards and he ended up knocking against the the side of the canyon that he jumped from yeah yeah that's all falling into place yeah <laughs> okay so so he comes out with this toy where you wind up this thing and it gets the wheels spinning or something you explain it he was every kid's hero because i remember when i was a little kid you know, getting a couple of bricks and putting a board on it and jumping my bike. And then you'd try to get your brother to lie down so he could jump over your brother with the toy. Then you could do the same sort of thing, except, you know, as a kid, you want to do it yourself. So the toy basically is got this uh, momentum motor built into it. You crank it up really fast. And then when you let go of the crank, it shoots the bike off. And then I had the scrambler van as well, which was the, the Barbie van, but in the uh, evil can evil version of it sort of thing and there was a ramp that you could have him jump over the scrambler van it was it's just so much fun <laughs> like that was one of my classic toys when i was growing up and when they re-released the toy i said i have to get this and i played with it with my kids and then went on to ebay and repurchased a scrambler van so i could have the complete set so yeah <laughs> we're just big kids oh absolutely and now so then the third finale for my show became oh, <laughs> yeah, when we get back to that <laughs> i guess we got to roll back to that don't we <laughs> <laughs> well i i got a, a goped scooter which is a little two-stroke engine on the back of a little tiny push goat scooter and created a whole finale where i would get somebody out of the audience i would take a part of my ladder and convert it into the jump that i would lie down next to them and then i would put a torch between their armpit and then one between their legs and I would jump across their belly basically. So that was finale number three. That's cool. Yeah. Super fun. And then the, the rest of the show is, you know, a variety of different juggling skills. So juggling balls, manipulating uh, cigar boxes, uh, doing stuff with hats, you name it. I've sort of dabbled into a whole lot of different things. Got it. So what are your favorite venues to do? Give me a time period of my career because it's changed over the years. Oh, was that right? Did yeah. you have a certain point in time where you were, you were busking and then you did cruise ships and then yeah, absolutely. then years later you did theaters and such? Is that how that worked? Kind of. It started off with street performing. Uh, I started in Ottawa and then started to tour with it. So I would take it to Montreal, down into the United States a little bit. And then when the Canadian Street Performers Festival circuit really started happening in the late 80s, I got up to Halifax and then did a West Coast tour the next year where I went to Winnipeg and Edmonton and Vancouver. And then those festivals started to just roll and roll and roll. And so you just end up traveling and doing these festivals during the summer season. Then I take the winter kind of off. And then in the nineties, I started going to Japan a lot. So Japan sort of was from 90 to 2005. 
And then when the stuff in Japan kind of settled down, I started to do cruise ships. And these days I'm doing almost exclusively cruise ships. And, and now that you're doing the cruise ships, are you busking at all? I didn't do a busking show at all this year. Last year, I think I just did one festival where mm. I was doing street performing. Your venue is going to dictate a little bit of how you are and, and what you're like on stage. So, or what you're like when you're doing your performance. And I right. think uh, when you're doing exclusively street performing gigs, you get really good at that venue and you know how to, like, especially for street performing, you learn how to extract money from people's pockets. Now, when right. you take that skill set and you put it into a theater environment or a corporate show or what have you, that aggressive style that is good for getting money out of people's pockets at the end of a show doesn't necessarily translate to being what a client wants right. from the entertainer in that other venue. So because I've been doing theaters and, and theme parks and cruise ships for so many years, my street shops are a little bit rusty. And so whenever I go back and do street shows, I always feel like, Oh, I remember I used to be able to do this a lot better than I am now. And, mm. and yet I'm happy with, what I'm doing now. So I don't really want to go back into that world as much as I had been doing it, say 20, 30 years ago. And it's, it's a young man's game. I hate to say it, but it's true. You're out in the elements and such, and, and you're working up a sweat in the hot sun. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly nice to be on a cruise ship where the theaters are air conditioned. Your audience is there to have a good time. The other thing is like on a cruise ship, you're not the reason why people are there. You're just adding to their experience. So the, the expectations are not sort of the same in that scenario somehow it's comfortable i go out have fun it's much less demanding on my body i mean i eat better when i'm on a cruise ship i go to the gym when i'm on a cruise ship uh and the number of shows i'm doing per week is significantly less than when i was in the, the festival market for me it's it's i've never felt like i've had a real job i've always felt like i've been semi-retired my entire life but now cruise ships <laughs> is even more so which is fantastic you get to cruise and perform and, and make money. Yeah, it's not so bad. <laughs> and eat and go to the gym. What a deal. <laughs> it, it's a lifestyle choice as much as anything else. It's just I get a, a a balance between I still get my performing yayas out on stage and I'm working in beautiful venues, which is awesome. And then uh, I come home and I sort of forget about it for a little while while I'm at home keeping bees and brewing beer. Oh, in fact, I was going to, I know it's kind of off the subject, but what is the deal with the bees? I, I, oh. I sent you some paperwork and, and I said, what are you interested in talking about? And one of the things was bees. And that's the one thing I couldn't find online anywhere. I, I posted some pictures on Facebook, but my friend, Mike Wood, who is another entertainer who's hilarious. He started keeping bees. He sent me some honey at one point because uh, when I started brewing, I wanted to brew with honey. Mm -hmm. And then he came out in the spring of this year and helped us get set up with our own bees. We started off wanting to do three hives. And by the end of the summer, that three hives had swarmed. Those hives had swarmed and it went from three up to seven. So I captured the swarms, put them back into new boxes, gave them more frames to work with. And now, yeah, we've got seven hives. And later today, I'm going to be out putting them away for the winter. Wow. So in my intro, I should have said, yes, checkerboard guy and beekeeper. I, a lot of the other people you've had on have talked about how important it is to continue learning and to continue grow yeah. in whatever they're doing. And for me, it's always fun to find side projects that force me to learn different skill sets so that even when I'm doing my show, you come at it with a more rounded personality. If that's not the only thing that you do, if you're more than just a juggler or a magician or whatever else. When an audience finds out that, oh yeah, I'm a beekeeper and I brew beer and I've got this funky love for old cool cars. And all of a sudden they have a lot more talking points with you more than just, oh, that was a really good card trick or that was a really great juggling trick that you did. And they, it fleshes you out as a personality. Which is really yeah, fun. it definitely makes your performance more rounded. Yeah, yeah. And more unique too, because, you know, Joe Magician is not a beekeeper. So right. he, doesn't, he doesn't put any of that in his show, whereas you do. I, I got to a cruise ship after uh, capturing a swarm. Like I was literally packed, ready to go. And the one of the hives swarmed. And so I spent the rest of the day cutting wood, making things together, capturing the swarm, putting it back in. And when I got to the cruise ship, I was telling the entertainment director how oh, about this whole thing. And I was like, okay, so imagine you're in a tornado of bees. And I go, wait, you probably can't imagine that. So let me do it for you. And I started running around her office going, <laughs> And she started laughing. And so there's this whole connection of like, not only do we like having you on board for being 
a fun entertainer that is easy to work with, but you also tell us great stories about, you know, being a beekeeper and dealing with tornadoes <laughs> of bees. So yeah, interesting. I mean, I'm really grateful that Mike was so willing to come out and help and get us all set up. And then anytime I had a question, he was a bee sensei. I'd call him up and go, okay, so this is happening. What do I do now? He came out again in the fall and sort of got us set up with what we need to do for the next stage. And then you put them to bed for three or four months. And, you know, by March next year, they should hopefully be coming back out and starting to make honey again. Do they, they hibernate? Is that what they do? So in the winter, especially in the cooler climates, I live on Vancouver Island on the West Coast. And we get winters that are, they're not as bad as other places in Canada, but it does get cold. And so in the fall months, the queen stops laying eggs. And so that there's a, a cluster of remaining bees that buzz at a certain frequency that generates the heat that they need to keep the hive warm enough to survive over the course of the winter. Oh. The thing you do before that is make sure they've got enough food stores because they'll go from the center of the hive cluster out to get some food and then they'll come back in. But if they don't have that food, that's their energy source for the entire winter for like three or four months of vibrating at speed to keep the, the queen and the rest of the, the colony warm enough to survive the winter. Wow. What other podcasts are you going to get that information? Huh? Right. Variety entertainer and B information all at the same time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go back to your, your busking career. Do you have any crazy busker stories, things that either happened to you or friends and things? Well, sure. There's all sorts of different things that have happened over the years. I, I love those moments when your original plan doesn't go the way you expected it to. <laughs> I was doing the festival out in Halifax, the, the big buskers festival out there. And this was when I first started doing that uh, scooter jump routine. Yeah. When you're doing a, a circle show in a street performing, especially at a festival, you talk about having your edge. So you develop your edge, which is the shape of the circle or I don't know, whatever shape you want. You can have it a square, you can have it an oval, but you create the shape of the audience that you want. And right. ideally over the course of your show, it goes from being one row deep to multiple rows deep. And especially the reason why a lot of people use a, a tall object as their finale object is so that that can go from three rows of an audience to 10 or 12 or 15 or 20, because if you're 10 feet or 12 feet or 15 feet off the ground, then a larger audience can see you from a greater distance. Wow. I, I never thought of that. That's great. That's smart. Yeah. So a lot of people get up on something high and the, the thing about the scooter jump is I actually break a few rules with that show and that routine because I, leave the center of the audience like I go outside of the center of the audience and then I ride through this gap hit the jump and jump over the person that's laying in the middle of the circle as the the sort of the focal point so you you never leave the center of your audience that's just you just don't do that and then the that routine is also really low so you you're not going to get 10 rows deep of people Got to it. watch it so and from outside of the circle I was this big Harley Davidson motorcycle was parked. And right when I was getting onto my little tiny motor scooter with this little two stroke engine, it going, <laughs> this guy starts up his Harley and it's just, like, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and you know, I make the ridiculous comment that, well, you know, uh, size of the engine is, you know, reversely proportional to uh, your manhood. No. And he, drives in to the circle on his Harley and I lie down so that he can jump over me. Now he doesn't jump over me. He just does a loop around the circle a couple of times, does the wave and then drives out of the audience. But how often do you get a guy on a Harley Davidson driving into the middle of your show? It just never happens. Yeah, everybody's like, wow, that was planned. That was amazing. How he got that guy to do that. That was yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People came up afterwards and were like, did you plan that? And no, of course not. Yeah, of course I did not. another great show in, uh, in Edmonton at the Edmonton uh, Fringe Festival one year. I got a little girl up on stage to to be a part of the show and she she looked like she was having a great time she was really going to enjoy what was going on and her dad's like ah uh, and I was like what what's wrong and he goes well her mom's from Japan and we just came back from Japan and so she doesn't really speak a whole lot of Japanese and the audience is in on what's going on. I go, oh, no problem. <laughs> Let me talk to her in Japanese. Oh, so, you mean she doesn't speak a lot of English? She doesn't speak a lot of English. So yeah. I, I, I dove straight into Japanese and she lit up and <sighs> she understood what was going on. And then I, there was a little boy on stage who was like, I was trying to do something with the two kids and he thought this was the most hilarious thing he'd ever seen. Uh. And he pointed at her and said, you're funny. And she pointed at him and said, no, you're funny. And they just started running around the stage and took over 
for the next five minutes. I couldn't do anything else. And the audience was just like in heaven watching. Why do you speak Japanese? What are the odds of finding a kid in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, who can't speak yeah. English and can only deal with Japanese? And how great is it that these two kids who don't speak their own languages can all of a sudden have this incredible moment that they'll remember for the rest of their lives? Yeah. The, the beauty of the street is that anything can happen. And the beauty of any performance, really, is if you're willing to take tangents and stray from your necessarily your script, if you want to call it that, you can have these incredible moments that are better than anything you could have planned. I talked to somebody else about this, I don't know, a couple episodes ago, about knowing your script so well that you are completely open to whatever happens at the time. Sure. Yeah. If your show goes completely off the rails or has, has a bunch of fun, like that tornado of those two kids you're talking about, yeah, if, if yeah. that's happening, you can step back and let that happen. And then you can go back to wherever you, you were. Yeah. You, you eventually find your way back or you yeah. don't. Sometimes I've seen really great shows where the performer just went, it's not going to get any better than that. Let's finish it there. Like, especially in a street show situation where there's less sort of pressure on delivering a finale that people expect mm -hmm. you can just do whatever you want i was thinking the, the the person i always remember and reference is abner who you had on a bunch oh, yeah. of episodes ago who said your show is what you do while you're waiting for what's really supposed to happen to happen yep if nothing happens i still have a show but if something happens let's go find out what that's going to be and, and chase whatever you know rabbit hole that is because it's going to be a little bit more interesting if you're open to it and you can think on your feet quickly enough to be in that moment and react to what's going on. Yeah. And, and if we're smart, we'll take a look at that and see if we can emulate that for our next performance. Sure. Like uh, reverse engineer it so you can have that kind of perceived spontaneity every show. Yeah. Perceived. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, that's it. It's, it's like, true. What is it? Sir Lawrence Olivier was said, yeah, when she, what is it? Was it him or somebody else who said, once you can fake sincerity, like once they believe when you're faking sincerity, you've got it made because you've got it. So if you can fake these moments of you know happenstance make it seem like this spontaneity is brand new this every single time then the audience is going to feel special and magical i mean sure you're a little bit of a liar at that point i guess but at the same time every actor is going out and doing something that is you know perceived they're they're providing a performance and the performance you know is partly who they are but it's also a, a chance to embellish certain points to change things so if you change yourself a little bit, are you lying a little bit or are you just giving an audience a different kind of experience? I don't yeah. really have the answer to that, but it's fun to not get too wound up about feeling that you have to be entirely honest every single time. Yeah, Lawrence Olivier, that reminds me of the, the story. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Lawrence Olivier is talking to Dustin Hoffman about Marathon Man. Okay. And Dustin Hoffman has to do this, this scene where he's, he's out of breath and he's, he's huffing and puffing because he just ran a long time. So yeah. Dustin Hoffman, he runs around the block a couple of times and comes back to Lawrence Olivier and Lawrence Olivier is just standing there watching him run around the block. And, and, and so then Dustin Hoffman comes back and he's huffing and puffing and he's like, okay, I'm ready to do my scene. And Lawrence Olivier says, why don't you just act? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Definitely. Now tell us about your superstar performing cards. Oh yeah. So superstar performer cards started in 1999 was the first year that they happened. And it, it goes back to a friend of mine, Sandy Johnson, who's a fantastic clown and performer who got these trading cards. It was like just found online or, or by a mail order at that point, because online didn't exist. And she had all these trading cards these baseball cards and i thought they were the coolest thing and she was like these are awesome because of who you are you should get one yeah. and i liked it but it wasn't it wasn't branded as a performer card it was branded as a hot like a, a football baseball hockey kind of card sports card yeah. and so i contacted the company and said would you let us change some of the text on the cards to make it more performance related and they were like absolutely it's not going to be a big problem and then i hooked up with my friend uh jim from the gym show who was also super into early internet fun marketing kind of stuff and said hey do you want to join me and invite a dozen performers to get cards for this first year and he was like absolutely i'm all over that so we did it in 99 and then every year since i've done a new design i've partnered with a couple different printers over the years i maintain a website that you can have your own card made and i love it as a, a marketing tool or promotional tool because Unlike a business card that always felt to me like you were trying to do business with yeah. the person who was getting the card, the trading cards 
feel more playful. And if you're doing a, a show and you're not a, you know, a guy in a three piece suit with a necktie, who's trying to sell you something, yeah. you want something that's more playful and engaging from the get go. So you can give out these trading cards and you may have some of your contact information on the back or you may not, but you're definitely going to have it these days a website so that people can track you down. And then once they're at the website, there'll be all your contact information. Well, the beautiful thing about trading cards was for me, I could give them to people who are prospective clients as well as just kids who really had enjoyed the show. And yeah. then I got into a whole, you know, finding really fun ways of handing out these cards as sort of a, a pre-show fun little teaser. And now, like before I do my shows on cruise ships, I'll go out after they open the house. Typically, they'll open the theater 30 minutes before a show. And I'll go out with the trading cards and I'll play a game or two with people like in Japan, like rock, paper, scissors is huge. And so I'll start playing rock, paper, scissors with members of the audience. And if they win, this is the setup. It's like, if you win, you get an official checkerboard guide trading card. If <gasps> I win, you get an official checkerboard guide trading card. <laughs> Knowing the rules of engagement, are you willing to play? And everyone's like, yeah, this is great. I, no matter what, I'm going to get one of your cards. And it, yeah. it breaks down the performer audience barrier before you even started your show, giving them a sense of who you are so that when you actually start your show, they're already on page and they're already ready to play. Oh, that's great. What's the website? Superstarperformers.com. So you're telling me if I go there, I can do the John Abrams superstar performing card and pass them out before my show? The, the 2020 design uh, is actually the picture that you used for promoting this podcast, I think. Mm -hmm. 2020 design is done. It's just in the process of getting to the printer and getting all sorted out. But yeah, absolutely. This is like, I never understood why people in this industry didn't jump on board for this idea more than they have because it, it, it's a turnkey, fantastic game and fun play thing that any performer can have. And the cost is not that much. I mean, it's cheapish. You can get 5,000 cards, 10,000 cards, however many you want. And if you start giving them away, it's just automatic promotion for your show. That is, it's fun and playful and interactive in a way that so much of your other marketing might not necessarily be. Yeah, it's fun, playful, and interactive, but it also elevates their perception of you with a playing card as opposed to a business card. Yeah, well, it's just fun. For the other one, for me, is like I've got the regular season card as well as the 1983 season rookie card. And if people see the rookie card, they inevitably bust a gut laughing because it's me at 14 years old with a bowl haircut. I look like Davy Jones from the Monkees, <laughs> and I've got I'm juggling meat cleavers because you know at 14 years old, what else are you going to do to freak out your mom? Yeah. I, I was surprised that, you know, how few entertainers went, no, this trading card thing is really going to take off. Some people who do it, do it every single year. Given how great a tool it is, I'm just flabbergasted that more, more people don't do it. That's so smart. Well, tell me about the, uh, the checkerhead brewing. Ah, uh, right. So about six years ago, my wife and kids gave me a brew your own beer kit for Father's Day. Mm -hmm. And one batch of beer after another, after another, it started taking over the basement of the house we had. And then we sold that house. And now at our new house, the brewery has taken over the laundry room. And I've got multiple uh, <laughs> chest freezers that I use for fermenting chambers. And it all kind of all started also the, the sort of spin on it because I was joking around with another friend of mine who's an entertainer. And he was like, we got to create a brewery of beers about performers. I think it's a great theme. And so all the beers, well, most of the beers I have that I re-brew on a regular basis are tribute beers to different performers. First one I came up with was Heavy Magic, which is a tribute to my friend Magic Brian, who has this character that's called Nigel Blackstorm. And he's sort of like, uh, if I say Spinal Tap, does that mean anything to you? Absolutely. This is Spinal Tap. Yeah, this is Spinal Tap. And there's a classic line in that movie about the amplifiers that go up to 11. That's right. And like, we should find, there's a, definitely a clip on YouTube. Find that clip and, and put it in the show notes. Anyway, Brian's got this character and he, he's got that sort of faux English accent and he comes out and goes, oh, I can buy my two favorite apps of heavy metal music and magic. And I created a new art form that I call heavy magic. And it's this <laughs> sort of rock show slash magic show slash ridiculousness. And so he's a big beer drinker and he wanted a beer made after Nigel Blackstorm. So we called it heavy magic. Initially it was a, he's a big IPA fan. So lots of hop, and lots of, you know, that, that uh, bitter character mm -hmm. that comes out of a, a West Coast IPA. 
typically IPAs fall in the sort of six to seven percent alcohol by volume. So that's where I shot for for the first one. But then we decided, you know, we should do a, a three different versions of this beer. It should be heavy magic, heavier magic that goes to about nine percent, mm. and then heaviest magic that goes all the way to eleven <laughs> percent. It has a little. Does it have a dial on the on the label? Well, the, the all like I have another friend who's uh, you know sort of related to the busking world, uh, Rachel Peters, who's done a bunch of the labels for me. So I've got a label for heavy magic. I've got a, a label for Tony Smith, who's a, a hula hoop artist from New Zealand. Hers is Mini Maniac Coconut Blonde, so a blonde ale that's infused with coconut three times during the brewing process. Mm. And then the tribute beer to Robert Nelson, the Butterfly Man, is Steaming Butterfly California Common. And California Common was a very specific style of beer that was known for uh, San Francisco. Robert, Robert Nelson was, he referred to himself as the king of the 80s on Pier 39 in uh, San Francisco. So I wanted to have a beer that was very specific to San Francisco and to do for him. So it came out as this steam butterfly. And then my friend, Mike Wood, who's the beekeeper, uh, his family's, his mom's side of the family is originally from Belgium. So I wanted to do a Belgian style triple and I wanted to use honey from Mike. So his is, well, I got to explain that Mike, how to, how to describe what he does. He launches a cabbage from a catapult and catches it on a spike on a helmet on his head. That's nice. his show. Nice. So his beer is a, a, a super honey infused Belgian style triple. It's called catapult honey triple based on what he does in his show. And then uh, I did one for my son, which is my son Koji's older. He's got a DJ career going. And so it's the OG Koji Kolsch. And mm. Kolsch is another German style of beer. I've got my own beer, which I call Checkerweizen, which is a Hefeweizen, a wheat style beer from Germany. I started doing these beers and I've got, I actually did one for Hilby. It's the uh, skinny German juggle Martzen. I started doing all these beers and, and giving them as tributes to performers not really knowing where it was going to take me. I still don't know where it's going to take me. Uh, some people go, are you going to turn it into a brewery, like a full-time brewery? And I'm like, yeah. well, at the, the scale it's at now, I can still lift everything myself. I don't need to have cranes to you know, move or a forklift to move big thing, bats of spent grain or stuff like that. So uh, I grow my own hops. So I've got enough from my hop yard to service my brewing needs for the course of a year. How many beers are you brewing in each batch, each one you've named? Yeah, so a typical batch of beer at the scale I'm brewing it at is about six gallons. Mm. So six gallons okay. of beer works out to, if you're dealing with standard beer bottle sized bottles, they're about between 70 and 80 bottles. Got it. At that level, it's very much friends and family at this stage. But you know, I love that if this were to ever become a commercial pursuit, Every single beer's got a backstory. Every single beer uh, references somebody and tries to sort of match up a, a variety of beer with the personality of the person that it's being referenced by. I could talk beer all day long with you, like hours well, and hours, but this well, would be like a seven hour podcast. You know? it, it would become that, yeah. Yeah. So let's, speaking of podcast, what, let's talk about your Busker Hall of Fame podcast. Uh, well, I started doing this podcast uh, about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And it, it came out of the fact that Robert Nelson, who is referenced in the uh, Steaming Butterfly California Common Beer, he had had uh, cancer in his neck. He was a legend in the street performing world, an absolute legend, and would also hugely influential with the IGAA, the International Jugglers Association, would go to all the conventions, would inevitably end up performing, was just this larger than life character who was uh, fantastic. He got cancer. He started uh, a treatment, he went through tre initial treatment, but then he wasn't going to follow up with it because at a certain point, the treatment had been so hard on him and beat him up so much that he didn't want to put himself or his uh, support people around him through that situation again. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know how long he was going to be alive. I, was, I, I just happened, he was living in Hawaii. I just happened to be on cruise ships that were going through Hawaii all that sort of November, November, December, January, February sort of period until about April. So I was going there a lot so I could help set things up. And I went for a visit and he was like all into uh, Mark Marin's uh, WTF oh, yeah. podcast. And he was really interested in listening to it. And I was like, you know, it would be really cool to have a podcast like WTF, but for the street performance community, because you're, 
like a legendary guy and I bet it'd be fantastic to have you as the host of this thing. Mm. And I sort of let it linger there for a little while. And a couple of hours later, I went, yeah, so about your podcast, let's make, let's make that happen. I really like your idea for that. So trying to endow him with the, the notion that all of this was his idea. Right. And then you, you came up a couple hours later and I went, so which do you prefer? Um, the busker hall of fame or the buskers hall of fame? Uh, I'm, I'm going to track down the, the, the domain name and, and lock it in for us. And then within two weeks of that visit, we had put out our first episode, which was a conversation with uh, Woodhead, who used oh, yeah. to be part of the Walter Woodhead show, and Henrik, who uh, a, a Danish guy who ended up in the United States doing variety entertainment. They were working together on a, a team show, and they stayed with me in North Vancouver for a night because they were just passing through town. So we got on a Skype call, we recorded it and we put it out as the first one and people who were part of the community really responded to it. So the initial plan was to try to get as much of Robert recorded between when that project started and then when he eventually passed away. And it was less than a year later that he, he mm. left us. So a bit of the wind was taken out of my sails, but people still seemed to want this thing to happen. So we started getting other people to do interviews. We started to get other people who wanted to be involved in the editing process. And I sort of manned the project for, again, about seven and a half years. I, I'm sure as a producer of a podcast, there are days when it's a joy and there are other days when it feels like a burden. Absolutely true. At the point when it's, I started having more days where it felt like a burden than it felt like a joy, I knew it was time to figure out a, an exit strategy. Mm. So I gave it 100 episodes. I said, that's, that's my target. That's where I'm shooting for and let everybody in the project know that that was where I was going to make my exit. And Magic Brian, who is now the creative lead for the project, has taken it over. And he's done, I think, three or four episodes since I left. In okay. Oh, so it was kind of fa fairly recently? Yeah, yeah, I left in, in, like, my last episode was in, I want to say, like, April or May. Oh, okay. And then uh, Brian's taken over since then. So my exit was this year, uh, 2019. and. It's so fun. Like I, I've been listening to your podcast as well because it's so fun to listen to your friends because you, you may not bump into these people yeah. like maybe once a year or once every five years or once every 10 years. There are people exactly. who I just haven't seen it's for so long that it's like having a friend in your ears for an hour and it's so great. There's something that my listeners don't know and maybe even some of my guests don't know it. I'm going to listen to this back and I'll mm -hmm. listen to it three or four times while I'm doing the editing. Yeah. And so by the time I hear this, I will have been talking to you for three or four hours. You know, everybody, when they talk, has a little verbal tics. They'll go, sure. um, um, and, uh, and, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, you know, and I got to feel that I wanted to clean that up. So I, I would take even longer doing the edits. I'd be like, I'm, I'm spending a week with a friend. That's how it felt. Like you'd sit down to do an edit and I'd be on a cruise ship and it was a great thing to do in my downtime on cruise ships. I'd sit down, I'd work on an edit. And by the time I'd released an, you know, 50 minute to 40, like anywhere between 45 and an hour and a quarter, basically sure. what they came out as you'd have been listening to the guy for an hour or uh, hours and hours for a whole week. And it was great. And I constantly learned things from those conversations and from the ones that you're doing too. But at a certain point, I was I was tired of it was feeling like a weight on my shoulders, and I knew it was time to to pass it along to somebody mm -hmm. else who was finding a joy in it again. So, looking over your list of podcasts, it's like a who's who of variety entertainers that you know. But yep. inevitably, you end up connecting the dots with other people that you've never heard of. Like we didn't know each other, you and I didn't know each other. That's before. right. And so there were all sorts of times. Like most of the people in that first hundred episodes are people that I know that were a big part of the street performing world for one reason or another. But every so often there was somebody that I didn't know that somebody else did a, a, an interview with, which was really, really fun and really exciting. So I got to meet new people via the project as well, which was really fun and exciting. Yeah, I love that. One of the reasons I love doing this podcast too is that I will hear an interview or I'll do an interview. Yeah. Then when I go back to, to edit it, I'll be like, oh, I missed that part. Oh, now, now I understand what he's saying. It's right. just little bits and pieces of, of things that, that people probably dig deep into their psyche that, that we just kind of go over. Sure. Uh, but in the editing process, when you hear it two or three times, all of a sudden you say, oh, wait a minute. Oh, now I understand. I, I understand completely what they're saying about that. Most people will only listen to a podcast one time, start to finish. And if you listen to it multiple times, you 
glean different things every time you listen to it, which is really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. It, although I, I do have to say, I am enjoying listening to things once from start to finish <laughs> sure. without having to re-edit them and tweak them. And, <laughs> you know, it's such a pleasure. And thank you for doing what you do to make it happen. Yeah, people just don't have an idea of how much work and how much time it takes to put this stuff together. It is a lot of work. And I will tell you, the ones that are fun are the ones that have great information and great stories. I listen to them over and over and I'm entertained by it. Yeah. And the ones that become more difficult are the ones that don't have great stories, that don't have great information. Okay, so you're only going to listen to this one once then, I guess, eh? <laughs> No, no, no. I'll listen to this over and over, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> kind of pulling back the curtain behind, yeah, yeah. behind but, the scenes on podcasts. Yeah, but I, I hope that if people are listening realize how much work you put into making this a reality. I, I was listening to another podcast, and at the, the very front of the podcast, he said that, uh, working in radio or working especially in podcasts is like working in a vacuum because you make it, you release it, but you you can kind of keep track of the stats just from numbers, but you never know. Like it's very rare that people write and say how much they appreciate something. That's right. It's, it's not like you're in front of a live audience and you get that no. immediate feedback. Yeah. And as entertainers, especially with the backgrounds that we have, we're so used to getting that kind of approval that if you're working on this project and putting in all this time, like hours and hours and hours of editing time to put mm-hmm. these things out and you don't get that same feedback, it kind of grinds on you a little bit if that's what you're used to. So here, here I'm going to say it, John. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for your hard work. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you to the people who wrote in uh, when I was involved with the Buster Hall of Fame project because it was so rewarding to know that it was being listened to and that people were getting something from it. That's really the whole point of putting it out in the first place. But if you're not getting that feedback, it kind of does feel like you're in a vacuum and you're, you scratch your head sometimes going, why am I spending half my waking hours thinking and working on this project? Oh yeah. Some of the nicest things I get occasionally, you know, sometimes I will get a message from somebody saying how much they appreciate it. Or one of my, one of my favorite things to happen is when I talk to somebody, they they go, Oh yeah, I've been listening to your podcast. And I don't, I don't even know it. I don't even know the person. Right. Uh, And they say, Oh yeah, I've been listening to you. It was great. I listened to this one and that one and the other one. Uh, I love that. Here's a question for you. Has this, has starting this project opened up doors for you that you wouldn't have had opened otherwise? Yes, because in fact, I've mentioned this to a number of people Uh, in Southern California. I'm very known, right? I do hundreds and hundreds of shows a year in Southern California. So if you mention my name to anybody in Southern California, they're like, oh yeah, John Abrams, whatever. But what this has done is this has made a name for me nationally and internationally. Yeah. So now when I talk to somebody from New York or, or Chicago or something, they're like, oh, yeah, I know who John Abrams is because he has right. this podcast. Uh, and one of the things that I have noticed, I, oh, I just, did you, did you see the big, um, I got a big, nice article in Vanish magazine? Oh, I didn't see it. No, congrats. Yeah, six or seven pages. It's great. It has big, nice pictures and all these different people I've interviewed. It's really nice. Oh, good. So yeah, it has opened some doors. And now when I go to a convention or something, I'm much more known. Uh, there. So I, I don't know if, does that answer your question, I guess? Yeah. I mean, for me, I, when I was doing the, that project, I got invited to go to Dubai based on the fact that the producer in Dubai was listening to the podcast. So, mm-hmm. you know, it opened up some doors. It also connected me with the the world that I was talking about really well, and certainly had, uh, had a sort of a, a People would then refer to me like they, they felt it was like a hub for the community, which was really yeah. nice. So that, felt great. Right. Same kind of thing for you, I'm sure. It's the exact same type of thing. Uh, I haven't been invited to Dubai, not yet. Not yet. Uh, but we're going to switch to something fact or something John just made up. Sound like fun? I can't wait. All right, let's do it. Is it fact? Ooh. Or is it something John just made up? Ah. Well, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to say a headline and you're going to tell me whether it's true or not. And if it is true, tell me a little more about it. Sure. Here we go. First headline. The hardest part of naked unicycle riding is the dismount. That is true. That is absolutely true. (laughs) I know that because I got to be on the Bare Naked Ladies Ships and Dip charter cruise. They did the first one, Ships and Dip number one, and they had this uh, event during the course of the cruise where 
they got naked with their fans. And so uh, they went to the top deck of the ship and everyone was wearing bathrobes and they counted it down five, four, three, two, one. Everybody dropped their bathrobes. Everyone was naked on the top deck of the ship and they got photos from above with just a fantastic photographer who took all these great pictures. And then they announced at the end of that charter cruise that, you know, we don't want to jump the shark. We don't want to go back and do this all over again. So we've decided not to do a ships and dip two. Instead, we're going to jump straight to ships and dip three. So they didn't do the sequel. They did the sequel to the sequel the second year. Okay. And when they did it for the second year, I was like, you know what? I have to do something more crazy for that naked shot. So I got on my unicycle naked with my bathrobe <laughs> on. And when they counted it down, they said five, four, three, two, one. I dropped it down. And like, Anyone who's ridden a unicycle and is a man understands that there's certain equipment that needs to be balanced kind of delicately yeah. on, sitting on the unicycle because all of your weight can go in that general vicinity. So I was very careful when I was mounting the unicycle. I was very careful making sure all the, uh, the, the equipment in, that is being referenced was placed correctly, but I had not considered the dismount. And so when I was dismounting off of the unicycle, once the picture had been taken, I was a little bit nervous about how it was all going to come out, so to speak. <laughs> Thank, thankfully, it, it uh, yeah, I, 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 I wasn't speaking in the high voice at the end of that particular. Event. So yeah, success, <laughs> success on both the mounting and the dismounting on the naked unicycle riding. All right, we'll go to the next one. David has entered seven checkers tournaments and won five. That is false. I, oh. uh, I get asked all the time, do you play checkers? Do you play chess? And I go both. I do both, but I don't do either well. Mm. And though, again, it goes back to, I was looking for a hook when I first got started. The checkerboard pattern became that hook. I don't even think about it. People actually commented on that or, or do comment on it all the time. They say, well, there's got to be a better explanation. And if you could provide that explanation in your show, that would be really helpful and really useful. No, there's no explanation needed. It's just what I am. It's just what I do. And and maybe uh, that's me being lazy for not having come up with it. But yeah. No, I, I like that there's no explanation. You just are the checkerboard guy. Apparently, yeah. Last one. We're only going to do three of them. Uh, last one. David can perform his show in six different languages. Ooh. Well, let me think about that. Uh, I think that's kind of semi-true because I've done, let's see, English, French, done a little bit in Spanish, a little bit in Korean, uh, a little bit in Chinese, and a lot in Japanese. So that's, yeah, that's six, that's six languages. That's six. Yeah, that covers it. I don't think of myself in those terms because a lot of the time when you're working in a place where the dominant language in the place where you're working isn't your own, I go to a less verbal show. So mm. I know having done uh, contracts in China, uh, I can get away with yes, no, and maybe in English and then have like a handful of Chinese phrases that I can drop in as well and I can get away with it. Mm. Same thing in Korean, same thing uh, in Spanish when I worked in Spain, but it was Japan. I, I kept going back to Japan so many times and I got tired of having people speak Japanese in front of me and I knew they were talking about me and I didn't understand what was going on. Around actually around the time I met my wife, who's from Osaka, Japan, was when I started actually making an effort to learn how to speak Japanese. And now my show is there's there's jokes that are very specific to Japanese culture, mm -hmm. uh, pop culture references, uh, pieces of his sort of history, and and just it it's become as fun for me performing in Japanese as it is in in English. In fact, sometimes more fun because. A uh, Japanese speaking audience doesn't necessarily expect this six foot tall white guy to be able to speak in their language and to understand the culture enough to really make it work. So it's really fun. Yeah, you have a similar story to Robert Bax. Do you know Robert, Robert Bax? I do know Robert Bax. In fact, there's a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of uh, guys who go to Japan to do whatever performing contract. And a lot of them, especially for me and a lot of the variety entertainers that I know were going to Japan, from about the late 80s through mid 90s, they would do like a four to six or eight week contracts and you'd go and you'd do three shows a day, six days a week. Because you were there, you met people 
who you'd go, you'd try to go out on a date. You, you were just living in Japan. So yeah. the fact that you met people that then became girlfriends or then became wives happened because you were just in that location for a very long time. So right. it just worked out that way. My wife flat out said to me when we first got together, if you're looking for a typical Japanese housewife, you got the wrong girl, which actually it was like, I wasn't looking for a typical Japanese housewife. I was just fell in love with you. So yeah. the fact that you happen to be Japanese just happened because that's where we met. But it seems to have happened to a lot of guys from North America and England who are variety entertainers who go and have these long contracts in Japan who inevitably end up getting married to somebody that they meet while they're there. And it's almost like a, a formula, like Robert Nelson, another example. Uh, Carol Hayes, another example. David Ramsey, another example. And the reason you bring this up is Robert, Robert Baxt. Robert Baxt, yeah. Yep. Married a girl from Japan. Married a girl from Japan, absolutely. Yeah. That was Back. Ooh. Or something John just made up. Ah. Uh, we're going to do some fan questions. You want some fan questions there, my friend? There's nothing I'd rather do. Okay. As actually, you're friends with a lot of people I know. Romany, Paul Boland, yeah. Anthony, the magic. I have to say it that way. Anthony, the magic. And Don? <laughs> Keep going, man. Oh, no. I mean, there's more, I'm sure, but, 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 but those are the ones that posted. Yeah, it's, it's crazy and awesome. That I'm 38 years into doing it, and you just run into people in 38 years, and they, a lot of them become friends. All right, we'll go to fan questions. Alan Sands, a comedy hypnotist out of Foster City, California, asked, do you know Alan? Oh, gosh, do I know Alan? I owe Alan an incredible debt. Now, for anyone who's a, a variety entertainer from the United States, walking into Canada and getting a contract and performing in Canada is so easy. For a Canadian going into the United States, mm. very, very difficult. So, really? Oh, yeah. It's really hard. If you don't have a visa, they will not let you into the country. And years ago, Alan Sands started a... Uh, a service because he would come to Canada a lot. I think, I think he, for him, it felt unfair that his Canadian friends that he knew and loved weren't able to get into the United States. And so he started a performance troupe with a couple of friends of mine. That performance Tesseract performance ensemble is privileged enough that Alan every year works tirelessly to help create a P1 visa for, so that members of that performance troupe are able to go into the United States and work. I am so grateful. Wow. Yeah. I'm so grateful. He is, He's a great performer as well, but that for me uh, sets him apart and yeah, uh, treasure. Anyway, you've got questions. What, is, what are your yeah. questions? <laughs> That's really nice. No, I love that. <laughs> yeah. All right. His, his, his first question, pretty easy. What was your biggest hat? Oh, uh, I was doing a show in the Edmonton Fringe Festival and I just kept counting and counting and counting and somebody was helping me count. I know there have been bigger hats than that, but for me, it was like, what? This is unbelievable. And I don't, I never really feel comfortable talking about an actual figure. So let's just say uh, it was, it was the biggest one I'd ever had. It was the biggest one I have ever had and uh, I'm still working. So it can't have been that big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't like billions. It was a yeah. billion dollars. I mean a billion on that one. No, not even close. <laughs> All right. His next question. Ask about his Spitfire sports car. He restored himself. Well, I, let's start off by saying it's it's not a Spitfire. It's a 1960 Austin Healey Bug Eye Sprite. And I got it when I was still in high school. Uh, I worked on it a bit myself. And then I realized that I wasn't going to be good enough to do a lot of the body work and everything else. So I took it down to a shop in Oregon, in Salem, Oregon, uh, about 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I just got it back last summer. And it is cherry red, like a dark, deep red, cherry red. And it's got the cutest little smile on the front of it. It's got a, a grill that is shaped basically like a smile. And then the headlights sit above the hood. So they look like little eyes. So you've got a car that's basically looking and smiling at you. <laughs> all right. He also asks, Alan Sands also asks, who all has stayed at his home over the years in his guest room? Oh my gosh, it's a who's who of entertainers. And drop, especially, drop some names, man. Drop some names. Uh, well, a lot of them have come up on this, uh, this podcast already. My friend Mike Wood has come and stayed a few times. A friend of mine named uh, Rob Zeiser came. He's an ex-Ringling guy. 
uh, my friend uh, Guy Collins, a guy named Andrew Elliott, who's a magician who is originally from Australia, stayed. Uh, my friend Tony Smith, who's got one of the tribute beers, she came and stayed. Yeah, just like... Just a bunch of variety of entertainers. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, and, and it was always like, if you want to come... Like I had, I think that's one of the things about the street performing world is you travel so much with it you go from where the festivals are from one city to the next to the next to the next to the next. And I was so fortunate in being housed by other performers in my early days of traveling that I feel like I owe a debt to the variety arts community as a whole is like, if you want to come and stay, come and stay and I will feed you beer if you come and visit. So <laughs> feed you a beer. And, and if you're good enough, we'll make a beer out of you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll turn you into a beer. Yeah. Uh, Owen Anderson. Yep. Uh, the magic Mr. O says, your prop packing for travel is insanely efficient. Did the act change to facilitate tight packing? Is there something you miss doing because it just won't fit? I guess that's a lot of questions. Uh, it's my street performing background that really informed how I do stuff. There's one style of Samsonite that almost all street performers have now gravitated towards because it's a strong plastic case that weighs not that much to begin with, so you can put more into it. And as long as it fits into that Samsonite, you can take it with you. And, you know, international travel, you can keep up to 50 pounds in your suitcase. So mm. if you start off with a, a strong, like a, a road case that is 30 pounds empty, then yeah. you only have 20 pounds that you can put in it. So uh, an, another friend of mine, Andre Vincent, who's from England, early on in my career said, it's great advice to me. He said, if you're going to put something in your prop case, have at least three things you can do with it during the course of your show have it come back again and again and again. That way you're packing more efficiently and you're getting the maximum bang for your buck in terms of what that prop can possibly deliver for you. Mm -hmm. I remember I listened to uh, King Pong, uh, oh, uh, Michael Trotman. Yeah, yeah. Your episode with him. And I mean, he took it to extremes by creating a whole show based around that one prop. But the idea that you can use a thing more than once in your show is really, really valuable. So Certainly, I learned how to pack so that all of my props would fit into cases that were 50 pounds or less. And I learned how to use those props multiple times if I could during the course of my performance so that they, I was not wasting space and not getting the most out of what each prop could do. That's, sm that's yeah. smart. That's great advice, man. Well, there's that. And then you flip it to, say, people like uh, you talked to Barry Friedman as well from the Rispini yeah. Brothers, and they would just ship like FedEx their equipment to the next gig. Some people would go, okay, let's keep it 50 pounds or less. And then other people, like, look at the passing zone. Another great example. Fantastic yeah. act. Best team juggling act out there these days. They don't care about the size of their props. I mean, especially if you look at their, the one where they do put audience members into space suits and then physically juggle them as props. That requires such an infrastructure that you can't pack that into a 50-pound suitcase. But they don't care. They they thought bigger than that. So it can be both a really valuable tool being creative within that constraint of weight and space, but it also can be a constraint. So if you want to be creative within that constraint, which is really good for me because of the work I do on cruise ships and that as a fly in, fly out guest entertainer, they want you to be able to have all of your equipment in 50 pound suitcases that you can right. travel with, then it's perfect. But if you're looking at doing stadium shows, well, you need you need to think outside of that box. Yeah, you thing. need you need big things. Yeah, well, I mean that whole notion of pack small plays big is fantastic, but sometimes packs big plays big also applies. That's right, to a point. For me, it's I have one bag that will hold the ladder I use. I do a freestanding ladder routine, and uh, that will also hold my unicycle. So I can put the ladder and the unicycle into one bag, one case that's got all of my other equipment, juggling props in it, and then. I have a, a suitcase that I travel with that's got clothes in it. Pack with three check bags, and then that three check bags gives me two full different 45-minute shows that I can do on a cruise ship. And then I have a, a backpack that's got a computer and just stuff in it, and uh, a hat box that I carry my top hat in uh, as hand luggage. There you go, Owen. Yep. <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, some advice for, for the beginner. Do you have some advice for the beginner? Oh, absolutely. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Mm. That's my biggest advice. True. My favorite Steve Martin quote, which is thankfully persistence is a good substitute for talent. Mm. He did a master class and uh, you can download for comedy and stuff. And he was 
it makes the point about people talk to me about wanting to, you know, how did you do your promo material? How did you do this? How you do this? And he goes, first thing you should think about is being good before you promote yourself. So if you're not having fun getting good, then this might not necessarily be the best choice for a, a lifestyle because from the get go, when I first doing, started doing street shows, I was having fun and I was getting this incredible fix of, it becomes really addictive. I'm sure you can vouch for this as well. When you have that audience performer exchange, when you're putting out energy and you're getting so much back from an audience, by the time you finish doing a 45 minute show, it's like a, being a bit in an altered state. Yeah, You feel a little bit like this adrenaline rush is pumping through your system. It's this really natural high that becomes incredibly addictive. So Yep. Yeah. You, you want to chase that. And if you're not experiencing that, if you're not finding that fun in it, yeah, maybe pick something else that you should could do to have fun. Yeah. I think any, any entertainer that decides to do this for a living or, or, or on a regular basis, even if they're not doing it for a living feels that high. I mean, that's what we're chasing. That's what, that's what we like. That's what we love. Oh yeah. Uh, my, my friend Jeff, uh, he has this theory that every entertainer is trying to fill some kind of part of themselves that's broken somehow mm -hmm. which i thought was really interesting and he, i was like i don't think i'm broken and he goes yeah you are you just don't know what it is yet just keep looking you'll find it <laughs> and you know i think to a certain degree there's some other uh, some some moment in your youth that is you know left kind of a uh, an imprint on you that you're trying to fill or trying to solve or trying to cure yeah. through this, this infectious, like you're getting this incredible positive feedback from this audience that gives you uh, a rush and it makes you feel excited. But it, it's just this, um, it, it, it's basically that Sally Field quote when she got her uh, Academy Award, you like me, you really, really like me. Yeah. And I think for a lot of entertainers, they're chasing that as well. They want to feel accepted. They want to feel worthy of the praise that they're getting from an audience. And Sure, there there's an exchange and there's like different ways of going about doing it, but that is something I think a lot of us chase as well. That we maybe are chasing approval from an audience for making a good life choice or for being who we are, you know, for being the kind of crazy, broken people that we all are. Yeah, uh, it's funny. I didn't recognize that myself until I was probably in my forties. That you're broken? I, no, that well, maybe, uh, but the, that's what I wanted from an audience, and that's sure. what I wanted when I was entertaining. You know, yeah. just to fill that void. Took um, took a while to get self aware, did it, John? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I think it's something we can all work on. In my twenties, I was just loving doing it. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. and 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 you you don't necessarily know how to articulate what it is that you're loving when right. you're twenties, but then later on, when you start to have those more introspective moments, you start to feel like, oh, okay, yeah, this is, this is why this is filling me up with such joy. This right. is why, yes, I'm having a great time, but then you ask the next question, which is why am I having so much fun with it? And that's when you start getting those deeper answers. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. So how about some advice for the working pro? So I, I got a couple the one that I think I'm going to share, which I really like, is uh, I went to a conference on creativity and the head of Pixar Canada was there and he talked about how if you picture a, a graph where you've got an X and a Y axis and the challenge is the vertical axis, the, the higher you go up on that side of the scale, the harder the challenge becomes. And on the, the horizontal axis, you've got your ability. So, you know, as you perform for longer and longer and longer, you get better and better and better and better. So what happens there on the 45 degree angle where your ability meets what the challenge is perfectly, mm -hmm. you're able to deliver to your client and be incredibly successful. Now, what this guy from Pixar said, mm -hmm. he said, unless the challenge is greater than my ability, I'm not pushing myself as hard as I can potentially be pushed. And I loved that. I loved the notion of trying to keep it above 45 because two things will happen. Either you will grow in your talent to be able to meet that challenge, or you'll come up with an incredibly creative solution for doing something that you're way out of your depth to be trying to attempt. And either of those scenarios have a really positive outcome. Yeah. I, I love the idea of the challenge being higher than your talent. Right. That's it. I mean, and it, that, and not only that, but that, that 
that fear of not being able to do it well enough really pushes you to a really interesting place too, where uh, you're, you're really in the moment when you're doing a show where you don't know if you're going to be able to actually pull it off or not. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm sure you've done these too. I call them factory shows when you're, you know, your mechanics so well, you know, your script so well, you're running through the motions and then you find yourself in the middle of your show and you can't even remember how you got there. Oh yeah. It's because it's just like, Oh wait, I'm, I'm doing this routine. I've got one more to do. And then the show's done and you lose track of it. It's because you stop being in the moment. That's right. For me recently, it's been, I'm going to try to put a new joke in the show today and I'll put that out as a challenge and it may or may not fly. But what it does is it keeps me absolutely in the moment for the entire show because I know it's either coming or I'm thinking about it after it's happened and mm. thinking about how can I make it better for the next time I do it. Mm. Being able to push yourself so that you're constantly giving yourself challenges, even if it's a routine you've done a gazillion times, making it fresh again by pushing yourself to make it a little bit different can go a long way to staying fresh and in the moment every time you go out on stage. All right. So how about a recommended book? I struggled with this. I struggled. I got two for you. The first one I'm going to tell you about is a, uh, it's actually a financial planning book that mm. my mom gave to me when I was 21 years old called The Wealthy Barber by oh. David Chilton. And I recommend it because it breaks down how to save money in a way that seems effortless and has allowed me to live. Like I know there are other variety entertainers in the world who make far more money than I do, but I've had an incredibly comfortable life because I put in to practice the simple techniques that are talked about in that book. They're not hard to do. And it just allows you to not have to think about money, which is just great. Yeah. It's called the wealthy barber. Yeah. By David Chilton. Okay. And you have another one? I do. I actually have two. Sorry. Uh, oh, the go, next one, go, go. Uh, the, the next one that I, I wanted to discuss was uh, now discover your strengths, which is by Marcus Buckingham and Donald O. Clifton. And a friend of mine who works for Best Buy, everyone in the corporate office had to read this book. And what it does is it, it dissects the things that you're naturally drawn towards as, in your personality. So it has what they call signature strengths and you read the book and then there's a code on the back of the book and you take an online survey and through that survey and the answers that you provide on that, it discusses what your strengths are. Oh. So things like, uh, for me, one of my signature strengths was uh, I like to woo people. I like them to be happy and feel comfortable. So what they did at Best Buy is at the cubicle that you were walking into, they had the five top signature strengths listed for each employee. So if you're going into uh, talk to somebody about, you know, the releasing of this new marketing campaign and their abilities are, they're good at strategizing, they're good at taking action, they're good at, you know, these types of things. And you're asking them to be artistic and creative. You may be going to the wrong person. And so I love the notion of that this book helped you identify the things that you're naturally good at because it then allowed you to interact with the world knowing what you're bringing to the plate so to speak. So you had a really good sense of what your abilities are. And so you can really focus on them. The book makes this great point about if you're a parent and your kid comes home with an A in English and an A in theater and an A in creative writing and a, a C in science and a D in mathematics, too often the parent will look at it and go, Ooh, you really need to work on the math and you right, really need right, to work right. on your science as opposed to going, Oh my gosh, look at how great you are in the arts. Let's put all of your energy into that. And let's just mediate the problems you're having in those other two things. Cause that's clearly not what you're going to do with your life and trying to get you to overkill, like do overkill on homework and stuff in those areas. That's not going to serve you in your life as well as getting you uh, a, like a, a summer camp program for theater and, you know, developing your creative writing skills and really focusing on the things that somebody is good at. All right. A third one. The last one. Uh, and I kind of ties into your, your, the, the thing you say in your podcast all the time, which is uh, now go out, book some gigs, have fun and make some money. That's right. That, that's my saying. That's your saying. Well, this book is called start with the why and it's by Simon Sinek. And in it, he says, instead of starting with what you do, start with why you do it. And for me, your saying is backwards. I want to have some fun. Then while I'm having some fun, I inevitably, like this comes to my, from my street performing background too. If I'm having fun 
and an audience is having fun, I'm going to make money at the end of the show. It's just yeah. the way it is. And then at the end of the show, after I've made some money, inevitably somebody's going to come up and offer me a job. So yeah. I took your saying and I turned it backwards. And I think, you know, I think that's what that book also discusses is like, look at what you do and remember that the, sometimes the client wants to understand why you're doing it, not just what you're doing. And yeah. so if you can start with the why, it, it just reverses how you think about what you do in a way that can be really constructive. Mm -hmm. There you go. Well, thanks, David. That was awesome. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for all the work you put into this again, because again, I have absolutely no doubt that people listening to the podcast have no idea how much work you put in to make it happen. I do. And I appreciate it. I appreciate you telling me that. That makes me feel good. 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 Keep it up. Keep up the good work. My, my, my head's all giant. I can't walk out of the room now. It's all good, man. <laughs> all right. So before I let you go, do you have some social media or something you want to promote? Well, you can, we talked about the trading cards. That's at superstarperformers.com. The yep. Busker Hall of Fame is at buskerhalloffame.com. Uh, if you want to check out that podcast, you can also find, uh, if you look stories from the pitch, you can find it on whatever podcatcher you're using for either Apple Podcasts or Google Play or whatever. That's that. You can find me and my performance career at thecheckerboardguy.com. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, I've got personal pages and uh, business pages as well. So, and you can, you can go check out my Facebook page for the beer. And I post every time I brew a batch of beer, you'll see who's being tributed and, and what's being made. And what's the name of that page? Uh, you go to Facebook and you look up the Checkerhead Brewing. Ooh. And Checkerhead, that name comes out. I used to, in my earlier days, I used to get my hair cut in a checkerboard pattern at the back as oh, nice. taking that, that theme even further. And so that was a nickname that I got. People started calling me checkerhead because of the checkers on my head. That probably helped with the naked unicycle riding too. At least you had checkers somewhere on you. Well, yeah, yeah somewhere. Like I, I'm not going to tell you where else I had checkers carved, but let's, <laughs> let's not go into it. Hey, enough, enough of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can't believe you took me down that road. Can't believe you took me there. I did. <laughs> All right. Thanks to all my variety artists. If you found this podcast valuable, spread the word. You can reach me uh, from my Facebook page on the variety artist. Just shoot me out a message. And while you're there, join that Facebook page where you can ask me to ask questions of our guests and participate in our free for all Fridays where you can promote anything you want. I'll create a free for all Friday post and you can promote anything you want in the comments. Thanks David for hanging out with me. That was fun. Absolutely. My pleasure. Now go out and book those gigs, make some money and have some fun. Or have some fun, make some money and book those gigs. That's all for this episode of The Variety Artist. But your journey continues on our website. Go to thevarietyartist.com for more strategies, insight and resources, as well as show notes on today's guest to assist you in your career. We'll see you on the next episode of The Variety Artist. But until then, go out and book those gigs, make some money, and have some fun.